Weston Boulevard. I'm so glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. I know that some of you are um, probably visiting us. Uh, if you are a visitor for the first time, we, we greet you with the love of Jesus Christ. I'm Bruce Grady, the associate pastor. Um, I am being joined by Beth Ware, who is our liturgist, and Elizabeth Davis, who is our director of worship, director of music. I'm so glad that we could be here together on the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Uh, Western Boulevard, for those of you who are viewing us via the internet, is right here in the beautiful city of Raleigh. We're at 2900 Chaplin Drive. And I uh, would love to have you join us as you see we are wearing masks to stay uh, safe as we're enduring and persevering this time of COVID-19. I'd like to personally encourage you, if you haven't already, to please be vaccinated. Uh, it is one way, including social distances, that we can um, continue to reduce the spread of the, of the virus and of the Delta variant. Uh, the reopening task force has been working diligently here at Western Boulevard to ensure our safety as we continue as a worshiping community. A letter to the congregation was attached that last Thursday email, but it was coming out again for you to see where we are and what we're doing and what we're looking at in terms of data as we're making decisions moving forward. We ask that you continue to pray for us. This is not an easy process that we've been going through, but together with the help of the Lord, we will make it. Um, I want to encourage you, you know, it is so tempting for me, because I love you guys, for me to just stand and talk with you when we're here in the sanctuary. It's a hard temptation for me not to do that, and I'm sure that it's just as hard for some of you, but we're urging you that when the service ends, to please exit the sanctuary, go out to the parking lot instead of standing inside and talking to one another. It's not that we don't want you to connect, we just want to spread the word and not the virus. Amen? <laughs> All right. So once again, we welcome you. We are excited about um, this series that Rebecca, the, in the brick interim, and I are delivering called Unravel, dealing with the multifaceted stress, grief, and trauma that we've been facing. This stuff is stressful, and if you, you know, if you haven't noticed it, then just, uh, you know, I, I would encourage you to do what you can to take a walk regularly or spend some time in meditation uh, so that you can be healthy as we get through this together. Amen? Uh, at this time, I will step down as death leads us in the call to worship. Bring all of ourselves. Dreams and prayers. Grief and doubt. Memories and heartache. God meets us here. God hears our prayers and sees our scars. With, With open hearts and authenticity, let us, let us worship, worship good, good and gracious God. God. Let us pray. Gracious God, source of life and love of all creation, in a world marked by bitterness, you are compassion. In a culture marked by confusion, you are light shining in the darkness. In a time of conspiracies and suspicion, you are the truth that sets us free. Your stillness is peace when we are frantic. Your strength is comfort when we are fearful. Your wisdom is guidance when we are lost. For all that you are and all that you give, God our Maker, Christ our Savior, and Spirit who leads us into life, we offer you all honor, praise, and worship now and always. Amen. Oh, creature. 
treasures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam, oh, praise him, oh, praise him. pure and clear make music for thy Lord to hear oh praise him alleluia thou far so masterful and bright that givest man both warmth and light oh praise him oh praise him alleluia 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 Others take your part. Oh, sing ye, Alleluia. Ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on Him cast your care. Oh, praise Him. Sing praises, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Elizabeth, thank you so much for bringing us closer to God with through that beautiful music. We appreciate it. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Since in every respect, he was tempted like we are, even though he had no sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace that we may receive mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. So let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor using the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. God of creation, humanity is capable of such evil. Stories in scripture alongside stories on the news remind us of that time a truth all, all the time for the, the moments when we choose violence over peace exclusion over inclusion and fear over hope forgive us when we choose pride over what is right and comfort over justice show us mercy and when we numb our pain Instead of leaning into empathy, unravel us, for we long to be changed. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. Who is in the position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. 
believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's generous grace. And since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. I don't care what somebody has done or said, we can get beyond that with the help of God's forgiveness through Christ Jesus. So turn to your neighbor and smile at them through the mask and declare the peace of Christ be with you. Thanks be to God, thanks be to God, we are forgiven, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God, thanks be to God. And now as we turn to reading the scriptures, let us pray to open our hearts and minds so that we can truly hear and understand God's message. Let us pray. God of word and wisdom, as we hear the scriptures read and interpreted today, enlighten our minds, nurture our souls, embolden our hearts, and stir our minds so that we may live out your word in the world you love. Amen. We have a healthy portion of scripture before you this morning. Um, we're coming from 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7, and chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Listen to the word of God. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, daughter of Aiah, and Ishbal said to Abner, why have you gone to my father's concubine? Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them. Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make expi expi expiation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, the king said, what do you say that I should do for you? They said to the king, the man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Let seven of his sons be handed over to us and we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son, Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rispa, daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merib, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the, the Meholite, he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. 
The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself. From the beginning of harvest until rain fell on, on them from the heavens, she did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Rispa, daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshem, where the Philistines had hung them, hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son, Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled. They buried the bones of Saul and of his son, Jonathan, in the land of Benjamin in Zela, in the tomb of his father, Kish. They did all that the king commandment, commanded, and after that, God heeded supplications for the land. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As you know, Rebecca and I have been leading you through a series entitled Unravel. The first part of that series, um, I spoke on the title, uh, What You Do When Your World Unravels. What do you do when your world unravels? Um, my focus today, but not my title, is what do you do when your plans unravel? What do you do with your when your plans unravel? And so the title actually, even though that's a theme, uh, the title is The Courage to Pivot. The Courage to Pivot. So to make it plain, we're going through a series, Rebecca and I, on the theme unravel, right? And so today, my link in this theme has to do with when your plans unravel, but the topic of my message is the courage to pivot. How many of you have ever had, how many of you have ever had your plans to unravel? I mean, <laughs> I see a few hands. I'm going to put up both my hands. <laughs> I mean, you just knew you, you, whether you use Outlook or your Google Calendar or whether it's in your Apple phone, you had a step by step, phase by phase with your list of actions and you're going to, you know, mark them done and so forth. And something comes along and just takes your plan and tears it into pieces. How many of you have ever had that happen to you? <laughs> I think most of us. So what do you do? What do you do when plan A, plan B, and plan C will not work? It's a tough situation, but it's not the first. You're not the first and you won't be the last to go through this. David the king of Israel at the time had a plan that was unraveling. And without going into all the details, but I know some of you will know this based upon Sunday school and Bible study, uh, David, before becoming king, was a servant to Saul. And Saul was the king, the predecessor to David. He had a son named Jonathan. And if you watch Game of Thrones or if you watched, uh, I don't know, uh, any any fairy tale where there are kings and princes and so forth, you know that the prince is supposed to become the next king. The prince, the son, the first son of the king is supposed to become the next king. So Jonathan was actually the one that was supposed to become the next king, according to the law of the land of Israel. 
But God had used the prophet to tell David and David's household that David, while he was a shepherd boy, would eventually become king. So keep up with the story. David ends up serving in Saul's kingdom in the house of Israel. David's just a little boy. And while he's becoming a young man serving, knowing that God is going to make him the next king, he befriends Jonathan, who is the son of Saul. So he befriends the young man who is supposed to become king according to the law. Are you with me this morning? Because I'm not going to be here long. <laughs> he, he befriends, they become the best of buddies. I mean, they're texting this, um, they're the best of buddies. I don't want to try to pull all those texts, but they are just as close as two, you know, brothers can be that are not biological brothers. And what happens is that they make an oath because Saul, the father of Jonathan, realizes that David, not his son Jonathan, is going to become king. Jo uh, Jonathan and David make an oath that they're going to look after each other, that they're going to have each other's back no matter what comes. So at the fall of Israel, while Saul is king, the Philistines attack, right? Their enemies attack. And at the fall of Israel, Saul is taken out and Jonathan, the prince, if you want to call him a prince, is taken out. But later, David becomes the king. All right. Y'all can follow Game of Thrones. You can follow this. <laughs> OK, so now the old king is dead. The one by the law who would become the next king is dead. And David emerges as the king. He is the new king of Israel. And as the new king who loved Jonathan as much as any brother could love another brother, he made out a, a, a declaration to his staff. And he said, look, is there anyone in the land who's left because when a country takes over, they try to destroy all those that are related to the one who was king. Is there anyone left of Jonathan that I can bestow grace, that I can show love in honor of my friendship with Jonathan? And so the staff is looking out and they're searching and someone says, you know what, there is one. There's one, and his name is Mephibosheth. And basically what happened is that Mephibosheth was a baby at the time that the armies of the Philistines took over and sieged. And while they, the, 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 uh, the caretaker, the babysitter, was running with Mephibosheth, the crowd, there was a massive crowd running for their lives. She tripped. Mephibosheth goes to the ground, he's just a baby, and is trampled. Yes, he's trampled, but he survives. He survives, and he is taken by someone into another land. So as I'm going back forward in time, David reaches out to the staff and says, is there anybody that I can show this love that I made an oath for with, uh, with Jonathan's descendants. And somebody said, there's this kid, Mephibosheth. And so they find Mephibosheth. They bring Mephibosheth to David's table, to the king's table. He is treated with all the respect, the love, the honor, and, and well cared for like anyone who was born from David. But here's where the twist happens. The Gibeonites, who at one time were the enemies of Israel, got in a dilemma. And basically, they were about to be attacked by Israel, but they were willing to submit and do what Israel wanted them to do. And they said, if you do this, what we want you to do, then we won't ever hurt, harm you, right? Well, 
The problem is, is that when Saul was king, Saul broke the oath and attacked the Gibeonites and killed some of their, their members. And basically, when David becomes king, the Gibeonites come back on the scene and that's where we are right now. The Gibeonites have come back, <laughs> if you're still with me. The Gibeonites have come to King David and basically said the former king made this oath that if we did what you all told us to do, and we did, that you would never harm us. And so that king, King Saul, attacked us and took some of our people. And so David said, as we read in the text, what can I do? Because I'm trying to keep peace in the kingdom. What can I do to appease the hostility that is now between you, the Gibeonites, and us, Israel? Are y'all still with me? Somebody say amen. <laughs> So what he does is he, he says, what can I do? Tell me what can I do? And so the Gibeonite representative said, we want seven of the sons or descendants of Saul, the one who broke the oath. We want you to hand them over to us and let us deal with them as they, under King Saul, dealt with us. Are you all with me? Okay. So this, on the surface, at least from the side of the Gibeonites, and on the surface as it, on the side of King David, looks like a plan to make peace. It looks like a plan to settle and squash a beef as you would say out in the streets. But David realizes that one of those descendants is the beloved Mephibosheth. The one that was the son who, of Jonathan who had been trampled that he had rescued and brought to his table. So David is facing what we call a moral dilemma. He's darn if he do something. And he's darn if he don't do something. What is he going to do? Well, I already read the text to you. He gave over the men. He didn't give them. I don't think he gave them the feeble show, but he gave over seven of those descendants. And one or two or three of those descendants of those uh, men um, were the sons of a concubine of Saul named Rispa. A woman named Rispa had sons from Saul. And some of those sons were the ones that David had sent off as a part of a peacemaking treaty with the Gibeonites. Now, we can obviously see what's wrong with this, right? You know, we can't, you can't end violence with violence. You know, it's just going to perpetuate itself. That's part of what we're witnessing right across the waters, amen? It just doesn't end that way. And so, and so Rispa, after her sons and these other men were, lives were taken, um, she is in such grief that she takes a sackcloth and covers a rock near where their bodies are on display. And during the day, she fights off the scavengers that fly. And during the night, she fights off the wild beast that would come. You all follow me? That, that would come for these men that have been um, taken. 
And then the word gets back to David after he had made this act that that woman Rizpah has not left the place where these men, her sons, are now standing. I'm trying not to be too graphic. Rizpah was a reminder to David that his plan was unraveling. You know, David probably at first thought, I've done it. I've settled it. The beef is squashed. I can go to sleep at night. But Rispa said, no, baby, it ain't over. I might not have guns. I might not have spears and bows. I might not have all the military power, but I'm standing here as a testimony that this plan doesn't work. That there's an injustice. That there is a breach. And I'm paying for it. I know some of us would say perhaps there is another way, but all of us have been in situations where our plans unravel when we were in our best efforts of trying to do what's right. And then we realized that we were in a moral dilemma. For David, there was peer pressure because he was the king. There was political pressure. There was the issue of his power, you know, because I think there may have been some self-interest, right? David thinking, you know, I want to stay king. I don't want to have an attack in my house from the Gibeonites. But I wish that David would have had the courage to pivot. I wish David would have had the courage to stand up to the Gibeonites and say, I can't do that. I'm the king. I have the power, but it's not right for me to do what you're asking. There's got to be another way. You all follow me. I wish he would have had the courage to stand before the people and say, the people of Israel, that we together have to pray and ask God for a creative way to to make peace. I don't know what that would have looked like. But I imagine it would have looked a lot differently than taking those seven. Amen. So, too, today we have to pray. Um, on a lighter note, and I should always ask for permission, but sometimes I ask for forgiveness or mercy afterwards. Um, for married folks, what may have worked in your parents' house might not work in your house. The plan in the way that they ordered their lives I know it didn't work. In, it doesn't work in mine. <laughs> I came from a much traditional home where basically whatever my dad said, it went. Amen, Lice. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> whatever my dad said, it went. But when I married Michelle, she said, oh, no, <laughs> that is not the way it works up in this house. <laughs> I know some of the sisters are saying, I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make a pivot. Years and years of formation about how a husband and a wife relate. I had to say, well, that's not going to work in this house. I need to pray and find some creative ways to make this happen. Amen. 
It's not just with our family relations. It's in relations with friendships. It's in relation to our work. You know, sometimes I tell my mom, I said, you know, the boundaries of work are different today now that we have these smartphones and the Internet. There was a time, I'm sure, in her day or in your day or somebody else's day that if you left your job at five o'clock, you can forget about it. Now you got a trail of emails, people coming back to you saying, well, didn't you get my email at, you know, the next day I'm talking. There's no excuse. But then you have to decide, well, how I'm going to create that boundary so that I can keep my sanity. A boundary that perhaps another generation didn't have. Well, you have to learn to pivot. And that takes courage. And even our church is learning to pivot. It's getting real quiet, but I'm going to say it. COVID-19 has forced us to pivot. It has forced us to say we may have never done it that way before. But in order for us to really be the effective ministry of Jesus Christ, we got to pivot. That's why I'm so thankful for each of you. I'm thankful for Elizabeth, for Beth, for the reopening task force, for Rebecca and all those that are even serving, volunteering. Because part of what we're doing with this piece of cloth on my face that keeps falling is we're taking the courage to pivot. And may it even be so in all the areas of our lives. As it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be, world without end. Amen. And amen. My friends, I invite you to join in me with our affirmation of faith. What do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to confess to you as we are sharing our joys and concerns that this is sometimes, oftentimes, um, the highlight of the service for me. So if you have a joy, a concern, I invite you to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you and you can share it with us as we prepare to pray together. Well, I want to, I want to, I know that it's on our minds. We're going to pray for the people that are in the pathway of of Hurricane Ida. And we're going to pray for the situation in Afghanistan and the families who have suffered loss on Thursday with the suicide bomber. And we're going to pray for our siblings in Christ in Haiti. Um, we're going to pray for our public schools and all universities and colleges and all schools. Um, UNCW has already had to go virtual because of uh, the challenges in getting around this virus. If I'm not mistaken, that's what I heard on the news. So we're going to pray for them. Are there any other joys or concerns? Yes. 
again ask for prayers for our educators. I'm privileged to have many friends who are teachers and administrators in our public schools. They are really struggling right now. So we really need to be praying for our teachers, our assistant principals, and principals. Thank you, Blight. Anyone else? Yes. I had scans on Thursday and they, were, they came back to me. Praise the Lord. Can you repeat that out loud? I had scans on Thursday and they came back to me. Let's. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Yes. Prayers for a colleague. Prayers for a colleague. All right. I like prayers for Molly Lowry. Molly is the wife of Gerard Lowry, who is a former member of New Hope Presbytery. He's the executive presbyter for Coastal Carolina. Uh, she's in the hospital with COVID and she's been having a tough time. Um, Elizabeth, you had a prayer concern. How is that going? Um, he is doing worse. So prayers for Steve Settler, my, one of my high school teachers and his family. His wife also just came out with COVID and they are, they live here in the Texas Mexico border. So healthcare is not as good there as it could be other places. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh God, right now, we come to you believing that you are the one who loves us, who watches over us, who cares for us, and who knows the best plans for us. As wildfires and wars rage, Earthquakes shake the planet, tropical storms threaten. We are at a loss as to what to say or do. In these moments of anguish and fear and grief, we pivot. We turn away from those fears and turn to you in prayer. Confident that you hear the cries of your people. As we send our daughters back to school, free to raise their hands in class, free to study and to speak, we pray for the daughters of Afghanistan. We pray for women shrouding themselves in fear for liberties recently gained to hold despite the new oppressive regime. We pray for the Afghani men, fathers, brothers, sons, uncles, desperately seeking refuge for their families. We pray for all the Afghani people whose lives are trapped in a war zone. We pray for the American troops morally torn over leaving this country and their service behind. Lord, have mercy. Turn us, O oh God, from violence as a justified means for achieving our ends. Guide humanity toward your path of peace. In your mercy, God, hear our prayers for Haiti. Hear our prayers for the people in the Gulf of Mexico. We pray for protection Protect them from this hurricane, Ida. Protect them from the next deluge heading their way. From the flooding. From the winds and mudslides. Guide, guide us in global mission so our efforts might provide relief and support. Great God of all, you know us well, you know our pain, you know our loss, 
You grieve with us as wildfires consume homes and COVID-19 fills hospital beds. You cry with us as tragedies plague your people. You work beside us in ministry and mission. Restore hope to the suffering. God, for those that are sick and shut in, for those that were named and not named, we ask that you would stretch out your nail scarred hands and bring healing in the name of Jesus. Restore us, holy God, with your hope. We pray this in the matchless, merciful, majestic, magnanimous name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. And using his words, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. the joy and the love of the Lord. We are called to be light for the kingdom, to live in the freedom of the city of God. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. Come, open your heart. Show your mercy to all those in fear. We are called to be hope for the hopeless, so hatred and violence will be no more. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God. Sing, sing a new song. Sing of that great day when we will be one. God will reign and we'll walk with each other as sisters and brothers united in love. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another, to walk humbly with God, to walk humbly with God. Western Boulevard strives to keep everyone safe and healthy as we worship together. Please think of others and follow these few simple exit instructions. So as we're getting ready to exit, I know you're going to be tempted, but I'm trusting you'll follow these instructed instructions. If you are seated on the pulpit side, that side, Please exit front to back through the columbarium, through that door right there. Um, if you are seated on the organ side, please exit back to front through the narthex. Leaders will be on hand to assist you through the exiting process. Receive this blessing and benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, 
equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belong to him forever and ever. Amen.